time that we get started for everybody. Welcome to everybody who is listening to this webinar for the um, Paycheck Protection Program Loan Forgiveness Application. I first of all just want to um, thank everybody for attending. Before we get started, I want to introduce Donya Parrish with the Montana Credit Union Network. She's just going to say a couple of words before we get started. So, Donya, I will turn it over to you. Emma. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Donya Parrish with Montana's Credit Unions. We are the trade association supporting credit unions across the state. And first of all, I just want to thank all of our SBA lenders, um, credit unions who are doing this have worked so hard and this program was not without frustration. Um, there were times they were working without guidance, with guidance that was changing three to four times a day and yet they persevered because it was so important to them to be able to help the business members and their communities. As not-for-profit credit unions, helping their local economies was really first and foremost So I just want to tell you how much we appreciate all of the hard work that was done that continues. And also a big thank you to Anderson's a million for their willingness to reach out to us and say, Hey, you know, what can we do to provide some valuable information as this loan forgiveness phase starts? So, so um, just want to express a lot of appreciation today. And with that, I'll just turn it back to Angela and I'll be available, but really this is, this is their gig and I'm just here to say thank you. Thank you, Danya. I appreciate it. Um, so I, I really do appreciate Danya for coming and helping between her and Tracy. They worked really hard to help make this happen. And so I want to thank Danya and Tracy and the rest of the credit union staff, and then also the other credit unions that are their members for being willing to join today to walk through this webinar. We're going to try to go through it pretty quickly, but we do want to make sure that um, we give you as much information as we can in the time allowed. So with that, I'm going to get started. Gonna get going here, so. I just lost my little icon, so hold on. So what we want to do today, until I can figure out why I'm not advancing, <laughs> um, we're going through the Paytech, Pay, Paycheck Protection Program Loan Forgiveness. And some of the things that I want to do, first of all, I wanted to introduce myself and Megan to you. So I'm Angie Murdo. I've been with Anderson Zermulin for about 18 years now, and I've worked in the attest department for the majority of that time. I work solely with financial institutions and uh, also with other um, for-profit entities and some nonprofit entities as well. And so I work in the audit department, working on fraud exams, consulting work, um, and anything that kind of just helps benefit to my clients. And so I am the head of the financial institution specialty team and then also am on the newly established PPP team within our firm. And then Megan Connors. Megan uh, is a senior manager in our Great Falls office and she's a member of the AICPA and Montana Society of CPAs. And she is also a certified fraud examiner. She has been with us for about 11 years and she also is in the audit department and specializes in healthcare, nonprofit, government, and other private entities. She is also on the newly established PPP team and is also on our nonprofit specialty team. So what we want to do today, it's 90 minutes and I know that that's a lot of time for you to really try to concentrate and listen to this. I know that a lot of the information we're going to give you is fairly technical, so we're going to do our best to help keep you engaged in this. So just 
you know, keep your focus for 90 minutes. We're going to have just under an hour worth of actual materials we're going to give to you, which will then lead us with 30 minutes at the end for any questions and answers. Please use the chat button that is available to you to chat in questions. Um, I know there already was one question that came in, and so that's great. So please keep using that. Make sure during the presentation you stay on mute, just to make sure that we're not having too much background noise or anything like that. We will be looking at all of the chats. We'll look at it throughout, but also make sure that we're answering the questions at the end. We're hoping that 30 minutes will give us enough time to answer all of your questions. But if for any reason we don't get to some of the questions during that Q&A, or if there's any ones that maybe there still needs to be research done, we will send out a Q&A after if needed. So um, just know that there is that time. So the more, if you really do have a question, please submit that question. We, we really do want to hear from you and what your concerns are. You know, as those of you who are working at the credit unions, you know, what, what are you seeing that are issues are the unanswered items that you still need information on and then the same with you that are businesses and what you're what you're still stuck on and having issues with and everything from that perspective so um, this is also going to be recorded so at the end of the presentation we will uh, get that recording out to everybody who's on the presentation today and then we will also send it to Donya and Tracy and so they can send it out to all the members who weren't able to attend today as well if any of them want to listen to this after the fact as well. So what is the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program? I know that a lot of you already have gone through the whole loan process, you know, from the credit union standpoint, filling out the loans, from the borrower standpoint of, you know, receiving the loan and everything like that. And one of the things on this slide is probably fairly obvious to any of you that has been involved in this. The goalposts keep changing. So because of that, there are things that are probably going to change after this webinar as well. We are expecting that there's going to be still more guidance that comes out. With the changes in the law at the end of last week, the SBA did put out some more information this week that Megan will go through. However, we do anticipate that there are still unknowns that we need guidance on, and we're hoping that that information does come out. So just know that you can go out to the treasury.gov, go to the SBA's website, go through those websites, and they're hopefully gonna give you information, but also let us know if there's specifics that you wanna know, is there guidance on this key topic? And it's something that we are keeping track of on a daily basis, if not multiple times a day to try to determine what's new, what's going on now, what are the different things that are happening. So um, please know that we're working diligently to make sure we're staying on top of the new guidance that's coming out. If you would like, we can add you to those emails that go out. We do have email blasts that go out to our client base, letting them know when there are changes that are significant and so um, if you're on this call today and you're not on those, please let us know and we're happy to get you added to those as well. So just so you know, everything as of today is what is as of today. That doesn't mean tomorrow's not going to change. So, so then the practical guidance and understanding the preparing the application. Everybody at this point has their loans for the most part. Um, there might be some that are still completing them, but at this point, what this webinar is really for is those who've received their loans and are working through using them for the operations of their business and are getting ready to prepare an application to be able to get that forgiven. So what you need to know. So the Treasury Department and the SBA did release the first draft of the pay text Paycheck Protection Program Loan Forgiveness Application. And because of the changes that happened last week, a modified version is going to have to come out. And so we are hoping that comes out any day now. We were hoping it would be out even by today, but I haven't seen it yet. So we're just waiting to see when that will come out and those amendments 
and how that will be affected. For the most part, we think we have a good understanding of what those changes are going to be. But like I said before, there are still some items that aren't 100% clarified that we are going to need further guidance from the SBA on. So some practical guidance. One, read the form. It, you know, it might appear to be overwhelming, but it is really fairly easy to read. Even though a new one is coming out, I still would recommend, if you haven't read the application yet, to read it. It's not, it's not the same as the CARES Act. The CARES Act is hundreds of pages long. This is less than 20 pages. It's easy to read. It gives you, excuse me, definitions. It gives you everything that you really need to walk yourself through it and at least get that general overall understanding of what you need to start compiling for information, what you're gonna to have to do to get ready for when you fill out the form. Yes, a new one is coming, but I don't think that it would still be a bad idea to read this form. It, it really is a, a fairly easy read. Um, one of the people in our firm, he actually calls it a good read. He thinks it's you know, fun to read and really likes it. And so I know there's probably a lot of people out there do not really thinking fun is the right word, but um, saying an easy read, I think is maybe a better way to go. So if you read through it and realize, you know, I still don't really understand this. I'm still not comfortable with it. I'm not really sure what I need to do. Contact those who know what they need to do. If you have a CPA you're working with, contact them determine whether or not they can help you through it. You know, you need to find your consultants who understand this process and the program and the application because they are going to help you. It is really important and imperative that you don't try to do this yourself. If you're not certain, this is not where you wanna guess. This is not something that you wanna to try to guess what you're doing. And so I think it's really important that when you're going through this, that you make sure that you're 100% certain on the numbers you're putting in there rather than guessing. You have a one-time shot to be able to get your loan 100% forgiven. And you don't want them to come back and tell you, no, you're not getting it forgiven because there was an error on the form or you did something wrong or you calculated something incorrectly. You wanna make sure that you're maximizing your forgiveness amount and making sure that you can get, if possible, 100% of this loan forgiven. And so that's something that I just want to let you know that you need to make sure that that's something you're working hard and doing it so that happens. So with that, I am actually going to turn control back over to Megan, and she is going to start going through the details of um, what is um, going on with the actual calculations for the forgiveness calculation. Thanks, Angie. I believe I have control now. That took me a minute. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yes. uh, first, and for yes. first and foremost, I'm gonna talk about the most recent developments that happened last week when uh, the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act was enacted on June 5th. I'm gonna go over these kind of on a high level. Some of them I'm gonna get into in much more detail later on, but just kind of wanted to give everybody the heads up of these key changes. So first and foremost, the minimum maturity of one year that was originally in the CARES Act has now been increased to five years, but there's a caveat, because it seems like there's a caveat or some sort of exception to most of this, is that this five years, is only for loans that were approved on or after June 5th. And that was based on the date that the SBA has assigned a loan number. Further guidance came out yesterday in an interim final rule that amended the first interim final rule, because there's about six or seven or even more at this point, that indicated if you had a loan prior to June 5th, that it, it can be extended up to five years if your lender approves it. So there is that little bit of flexibility in there now uh, that wasn't certain even a few days ago, um, that it can be up to five years, it just has to be approved by your lender. It changed the covered period to 24 weeks. Again, another caveat here is that if you received a loan prior to June 5th, you are still eligible to take the original eight week covered period. 
any loans that are approved after June 5th will need to use that 24 week covered period. It changed the date, the, the moving target for your reinstatement of wage reductions or FTE reductions to December 31st from June 30th. And then it also included some additional exemptions for the FTE reduction based on employee, employee availability. And I'm gonna go over those in much more detail uh, here in a bit. It increased the non-payroll costs from 25 to 40%. And then something really important to note on this is that it's not, the, the 60 40 rule is really a percentage of the forgiveness amount. So if you've got any amounts in there that are not gonna be forgiven, then it, that that 60 40 applies to that. So a really good example of that is let's say you use 54% of your loan on payroll costs. Obviously you didn't hit that that 60% target. So the calculation is actually so let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar loan. The calculation is actually gonna take, you know, you use 54%, so fifty four thousand dollars, and you have to divide that by 0.6 to see what the 60% of the forgiveness amount. And that's actually gonna maximize your total forgiveness amount at 90,000 versus 100,000. So you see right there that it's not just, you know, 54,000, you know, and then the difference to get to 60% would have been 6,000. It's actually the forgiveness amount, not the loan amount. And, and I know that can be really confusing um, if you're not seeing it in writing, um, but it is in that interim final rule um, a, amendment yesterday that example is in there. And, and if you read that, it's actually pretty clear, but that was something that they, they clarified yesterday. It also uh, extended the deferral period for 10 months after the last day of your covered period. But this is just for applicants who don't apply for any forgiveness. So that 10 month deferral period applies to them. But what it also means is that all, all borrowers have up to 10 months to apply for the forgiveness before that, that deferral ends and then they're not eligible for any forgiveness. So 10 months after the end of the covered period is kind of the, the key date for applying for your forgiveness. And then for borrowers who do apply for the forgiveness, your payments are actually gonna be deferred to the date that SBA remits the forgiveness amount to the lender. And that, that can be kind of subjective because your lender has 60 days from the date that you apply for your forgiveness to let the SBA know, you know that they've approved your application and then they, the SBA actually has another 90 days. And so you know, there's kind of a, a five month window in there even after you apply for forgiveness. Um, it is important to note that the day that you apply for forgiveness is the day that interest does start accruing for any amounts that might not be forgiven and need to be repaid. So let's go over some key definitions. First and foremost, you know, as the bulk of this program is for, you know, paycheck and wages and whatever, cash compensation. So that's gonna include all of your gross salaries, your tips, your commissions, any paid leave, except for any paid leave that will be covered by the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And that is because there's eligible credits for those and you can't, you can't double dip. And so any leave that's gonna be utilizing those credits cannot be included in this cash compensation amount. The other, the other two caveats here for cash compensation is that uh, it's not to exceed $100,000 as prorated for the covered period for any employee. And then also you're not allowed to include any employees who are not located in, in the US. So any, any for, uh, employees living internationally are not included <clears throat> in this cash compensation. Average FTEs, so the application uh, defined how you calculate your average FTE, and that's using actual hours paid per covered pay period, but not exceeding 40 hours per employee. So any, any 40 plus hours, you know, it's an automatic one FTE. So then the remaining hours, you divide by 40 to round to the nearest tenth to get the uh, weekly FTE. So if you're paying on a biweekly, you know, it'd be 80 hours and whatnot. There is a simplified FTE method. So that's gonna assign a one for each employee who works 40 hours or more, and then an automatic 0.5 for any part-time employee who's working less than 40 hours. And then there is some salary and hour reduction amounts in there. Um, it's important to note that it's compared to what was paid during the covered period back to the first quarter of 
2020. Uh, the other important thing to know is that you can restore those reductions by December 31st and there'll be no additional reduction of your forgiveness amount. And then also, if you didn't reduce those wages or hourly rates by more than 25%, it's not going to have any, any impact else as well. Some additional practic practical guidance here. And the important part here is that we need to document, document, document. There's, there's some really key things we're going to go over right now. And SBA has up to six years to review or audit these loans. And so, you know, anything that you guys are documenting as part of the forgiveness application, even if it's not submitted to your lender, all of that supporting documentation and, you know, the decisions that you made need to be retained for at least six years. And these are kind of the, the starting points that are going to help you guide yourself to make the best possible choices to maximize your forgiveness amount. So first and foremost, what was your PPP loan amount? What was the date that the loan was dispersed and hit your bank account? What's the first date of your pay period starting that starts after the PPP disbursement? And we'll go over why here in a minute on the importance of that. If you received your PPP loan prior to June 5th, you're gonna to need to document whether you will choose the original eight week covered period or the new 24 week covered period. And then there's also an alternative payroll covered period election. So if you are paying payroll on a weekly or biweekly basis, you're allowed to choose for payroll costs an alternative covered period that starts your covered period for payroll costs on the, the date of your next pay period that starts after that PPP disbursement. You wanna document the beginning date of your covered period elected, the eight or 24 weeks, and then the ending date. So option one, so you can use the eight week or 56 day covered period or the 24 week or 168 day covered period. And for non-payroll costs, or if you do not choose the alternative, this is based on the first day of your PPP loan disbursement. So if you get your funds deposited on a Sunday night at 5 p.m., that, that day is included in your covered period. So for example, let's say you got your proceeds Monday, April 20th. The first day of your covered period is the 20th, and then the last day for an eight-week covered period would be June 14th. Uh, for a 24-week, it would be uh, October 5th. Option two, so for payroll costs, and you wanna choose the alternative covered period, and you got your PPP funds on April 20th, but your first pay period starts on April 26th, your payroll costs will use a covered period starting April 26th, and then the last day for an eight-week covered period would be June 20th or October 11th for 24 weeks. And it, the important thing to know is that that alternative covered period was really, it doesn't change things dramatically. Uh, what it is supposed to do is relieve some of the administrative burden because then your covered periods are following your payroll schedule. So you're not having to do a calculation for accrual days, you know, before or after your covered period based on how many days were included in those pay dates paid. It's just supposed to make it easier for you to, you know, gather the information and have an easier time determining those amounts. This might not be as relevant now if you're going to be choosing the 24 week period because you know if, if you were getting close to the end of your eight week covered period uh, prior to this allowance of the 24 week covered period and you were getting kind of nervous that you might be um, under on your payroll costs might not have spent any of you know the funds you know necessary you wouldn't have spent them all by the end of the eight week period you would have had to try and do some you know estimates to make sure that you know you're making some decisions closer to the end of your eight week covered period to make sure that you're maximizing those eligible costs at this time, now that you're allowed to choose a 24 week period, it might be a little bit of a moot point because you're getting some extra time to make sure that you're spending those properly in accordance with how much you need to use on payroll versus non-payroll, et cetera. So now I kind of want to start into, you know, the detailed calculations here on what you need to be looking at. And granted, this is going to be very high level. It's not going to show exactly what you're going to be compiling and looking at when you're when you're doing this for you know the application but this is just kind of a high level summary of you know what it might look like so all my examples here are going to be utilizing an eight-week covered period because that's 
you know, what we know of right now um, in the application itself, but also just to kind of keep it short and simplified. So for each week that's incurred in your eight week period, so whether you're paying weekly or biweekly, you're gonna need to do this by employee, but we're gonna keep it summarized here. But you need to, you're gonna need to create a spreadsheet or use your payroll summaries if they include all the information necessary to document certain things. But for the FTE calc, you're gonna to wanna to know how many full-time employees are working 40 hours or more, and you're gonna count those as an automatic one FTE. So for my example, this is a weekly payroll. So for the week of April 20th, you know you have 15 employees that are working 40 hours or more. Then you've got some part-time employees. You've got four part-time employees that combined during the week of April 20th worked 100 hours. So you're gonna take 100 hours uh, divided by 40, and you're going to get 2.5. So that, for those part-time employees, they are 2.5 full-time equivalents. And then so forth, here's another example for a, the week of April 27th, they worked 110 hours, that would equal 2.8 FTEs. When you're gathering this information for all of your employees, make sure that you are documenting, you know, how much they were, how much they made in gross compensation, how many hours they worked, you're also gonna to need to compile a bunch of different information for periods that were prior to your covered period. You're gonna to need to know what their hourly rate or salary was on February 15th of 2020. And we'll go over some of the, the reasons why for this here in a bit. You're gonna to wanna to know what their average salary or average hourly wage was between uh, February 15th and April 26th. You're gonna to need to know what their annual salary or average hourly wage was as of December 31st of this year or at the date that any wage reduction was restored. So if you had an employee and you took them down, you know, in their salary during, you know, during COVID, but you brought it back up, you know, by December 31st and it, it, it can be done before, you're just going to need to document that and, and what date that was. And then obviously here, the weekly gross wages and hours worked. So this is kind of a summarized uh, calculation, you know, for uh, in total that this, this schedule in the, in the forgiveness application will be by employee. But for each week, here was your amount that you had for full-time employees, part-time employees, and then what their full-time equivalent was. And so you're going to have all of these summarized um, up into a weekly average calculation. So here's the total for week one, two, three, and then weeks five through eight, or four through eight here. Um, each of those weeks has 16.8, just to kind of simplify the schedule so it didn't get too long for our, our slides here. So on the, the eight week cover period, you had a total of 136.2 FTEs, and then you take that and divide it by eight to get your average. And so for this eight week covered period for this bar where they had 17.1 FTEs. Schedule A of the forgiveness application is the bread and butter of the entire application. This is the most important part and it's broken into four different sections that's gonna help you arrive at uh, your payroll costs and any reduction um, for the application. Table one is gonna list by employee, any employees who made less than $100,000 at any point in 2019. And the important part here is that the wording is annualized during any pay period in 2019. So if you bonus somebody out and that bonus brought them to a annualized salary of $100,000 or more, they do not go on table one. They are automatically brought down to table two for employees who did make at any point or any pay period in 2019 an annualized salary of over $100,000. So that's the same information goes into both of those tables. It's just which employees get put into, into each bucket. On schedule A line nine, that's where the owner employees, self-employed individuals and general partners get uh, documented for their compensation amounts. And the only amounts that need to go on there is compensation. There's nothing for FTEs. You don't have to include them in the FTE count. And then at the very bottom of Schedule A, it goes over the calculation for any FTE reductions if necessary. So here's an example of what Table 1 looks like. So we've got Mr. Penn here who's got his employee identification number. 
And then here's his cash compensation for the covered period for the entire eight week period and his average FTE. If you had taken Mr. Penn down below 25% uh, of their wages as of February 15th, you would show the, the salary or hourly wage reduction amount here if it's applicable. We're gonna assume that nobody was reduced below 25% for our examples here. At the bottom of table one, there is one box for FTE reduction exemptions, and that's uh, for any employees that meet these exemptions, which we'll go over, you get to add back their FTE amounts here so that it doesn't affect your reduction. And same thing for table two, it will look exactly the same. It's just that those, these are the uh, individuals that were paid more than $100,000. Uh, Schedule A actually doesn't necessarily dictate that a table is necessary unless you've got one or more self-employed individual or uh, owner employee or general partner that needs to be listed. And then the application does ask that you create a schedule to just add the same kind of information. It doesn't need to have the FTEs on there, but it will need to show their compensation for the covered period so that you can come to a total that will go on the application. So here's, here's where we're gonna talk about these FTE uh, reduction exemptions. So the first and foremost question you need to ask yourself is the, did you reduce your FTEs after February 15th and prior to April 26th? April 26th might seem like a funny date, but that's what they're calling the safe harbor period because it was 30 days after the enactment of the CARES Act. Um, so any FTE reduction might be necessary if you can't meet any of these safe harbor provisions as they've, um, as amended with the PPP Flexibility Act. So number one, you're unable to rehire individuals that you might have laid off or furloughed um, after February 15th. You are unable to rehire similarly qualified employees for unfilled positions on or before December 31st. Or if you can document that there's an inability to return to your normal business operations as they were on February 15th due to certain compliance requirements issued by uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and one other organization, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but if they've issued any guidance after March 1st through the end of the year related to any standards for sanitation, social distancing, or other worker and customer safety requirements, and you can't return to normal operations and can document that, then you won't have an FTE reduction. It's important here to document, document, document everything. So if you've got one, of, one or any or all of these situations, you need to start putting you know, your documentation into place. If you called an employee and offered to you know, give them their job back and they turned you down, then you need to have that documented somewhere. It doesn't have to be signed off by the employee. It can just say, you know, I called them on this date, offered them their job, and they, and they turned us down. The really important thing to note here that they came out with additional guidance on is that if this is the case, you have 30 days to call the state unemployment agency office and report them as you know, turning down your job because, you know, that's going to eliminate their ability for unemployment insurance. And so that's part of the requirements is that you also document that you did that within 30 days. The other FTE reduction safe harbor is looking at your FTEs as of February 15th, the FTEs during the safe harbor period of February 15th and April 26th. If your average during that safe harbor period was higher, then you don't have a reduction. But let's say you reduce your employees, you're gonna have to make sure that by December 31st, you've reinstored, reinstated them for at least the numbers. The FTE reduction calculation allows for your choice in a reference period. So now you know, you've determined that you can't restore your FTEs, you don't meet any of those reduction exemptions, and you're gonna possibly be looking at a reduction calculation. So what we're gonna do now is calculate the FTEs during your covered period of eight weeks or 24 weeks, and then you have to compare that to an average of your FTEs with a reference period. And there's three different options available. 
So option one is you select your reference period of February 15th of 2019 to June 30th of 2019. Option two is looking at a reference period of January 1 of 2020 to February 29th of 2020. And then if you're considered a seasonal employer, you can choose any 12 week period from May 15th, 2019 through September 30th of 2019. It, obviously our recommendation here is to use the FTE reference period that has the lowest FTE numbers because you want that to be lower than your, than your covered period to you know, eliminate any reduction necessary. So if you're going through this process, here's kind of what the calculation is going to look like. You're going to average your FTEs during your chosen reference period, and then you're going to total, you're going to take a total average of FTEs from Schedule A, uh, tables one and two. And again, noting that no owner employees or self-employed individuals are included in the FTE count. And so your total average FTEs is going to be compared to the reference period. If this is higher than your reference period, then you don't have any reduction. But if the reference period is still higher than your covered period, you're going to have an FTE quotient reduction that's going to be calculated. Uh, based on our example before, we had the original 18 FTEs um, during our reference period, and then that 17.1 that we calculated during our chosen covered period. Obviously, this is still lower than this 18 FTE from our reference period. And so you're going to have a 0 0.9500 that goes to line 13 of Schedule A that is going to reduce your forgiveness amount. So what options do you have available to maximize your debt forgiveness? Obviously, payroll cost is uh, the most important because it has to be at least 60% of the forgiveness amount. Um, there are several different options, obviously, you know, based on whether you pick an eight or 24 week covered period or the election of your alternative covered period. Selection of your reference period to compare your FTEs. Again, you want your reference period to show the lowest number. And then whether you, you elect that FTE simplified method, which if you haven't had a major change in your FTE counts or you don't fluctuate you know, very often, that might just be the easiest way to go if it's not gonna affect your forgiveness amount. Here's the other payroll cost you don't wanna forget to include in the cash compensation. You can include employer health insurance contributions, including any self-insured group health insurance premiums. These must exclude pre-tax amounts for employees. You can include retirement contributions, whether you have a 401k match, pe pension or discretionary profit sharing contributions. It is important to know that these profit sharing contributions must be prorated for the covered period elected. And then your state employer taxes like SUDA. Most important part here is that these taxes are any taxes that are uh, assessed on employee compensation, which might vary state to state. What are our eligible non-payroll costs to make up the other 40% of our forgiveness amount? Rent expense on real or personal property. These lease agreements must be in place on February 15th to be eligible for the forgiveness calculation. Um, it can include you know, building, offices, equipment, vehicles, you know, so it covers, you know, a wide range of, of lease payments. You can now include interest on other debt obligations. This was kind of something that came out in this updated interim final rule that in addition to mortgage interest, which we have here, I don't know why that jumped to the top, uh, the mortgage interest on any obligations in place on February 15th, they're now allowing other interest on debt obligations that were in place or incurred on February 15th. Utility payments for utilities that were in service on February 15th, and these include electric bills, gas bills, water bills, telephone or cell phone, internet access, and transportation. The key part here with transportation is it's pretty much the, the biggest gray area that we have on these non-payroll costs. We, we've not received a definition in any of the guidance from SBA that indicates what these transportation costs are to include. And so recommend working with your lenders or your CPAs to, to kind of help guide you in determining what those are if we don't receive any guidance on that. And then again, the key point here, no more of the PPP loan proceeds can be discharged with non-payroll costs.
Non-payroll costs must be paid during the covered period or incurred within the covered period, but paid by the next regular invoice billing date. So that's kind of allowing us that accrual basis of accounting where you've got, you know, your covered period ends on June 30th, and but you might not get that bill until mid-July or even early August for that time frame. But you, as long as you pay that by the bill due date, you can include those costs for the days included in the covered period in the forgiveness application. So with that, we are going to start moving into the Q&A section of uh, the presentation. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Angie and she's gonna get this going from there. Great, thank you. So I do have a couple questions and then one thing that I was going to um, give a quick example based on some of the questions that we've had um, just from our clients as well. One of the things that um, we get a lot when it comes to the, um, and this is kind of starting with the end of the presentation, but one of the things that has asked a lot is with these utilities, you know, how how you deal with, you know, weird cutoff dates. And so just kind of to give you a, a good example, say your um, PPP loan, if you decide to use the eight week or 24 or whatever, whatever it is, the last day of your loan, say it's you know, June 20th, and you then have your power bill and it goes through June 30th, and then you get that power bill you know, in say July 10th. Well, part of that power bill was from June 1st to June 30th. 20 days of that was included in your covered period. So even though the ending date of it was not in your covered period and you received it after, you can include it, but you have to make sure you're prorating that. So because of that, you wanna make sure that you're only including the 20 days that actually was included in your covered period, not the entire bill. So just kind of as a caveat to those, make sure when you're receiving those bills that you receive after the covered period, if there's days that are included and days that are not, you just have to be careful to make sure you're properly prorating those bills. Um, a couple questions, and actually I received a question um, via email from one of the people on here as well. And one of the things that was asked, and this is something that we're going to follow up from a gap perspective to determine whether or not the AICPA is going to change the rules on this or if it's something they want to keep it at the same. So and so this has to do with the credit unions and when they're receiving the fees. So when they make these loans and when they're helping all the businesses through these loans, they receive a fee. And so that fee is then paid by the SBA. So when you went if you are business ABC and you went to your local credit union and you they helped you apply to get this loan through the SBA. It was fully funded through the SBA, through the, through the credit union. However, the SBA then pays a fee, which is why you didn't have to pay a fee to your bank or credit union. And so because of that, those fees are coming in and they're starting to um, actually get paid at this point. Um, I do have several clients who are starting to receive those payments. And the question is, is how do you account for these fees? It's something that is, has to do with how, typically how origination fees are accounted for within a, a credit union. And typically what they're supposed to be done is amortized over the life of the loan. Well, this obviously is not quite that simple because of the fact that what happens is what do you do if it gets forgiven? What do you do if part of it gets forgiven? What do you do if they choose the two-year versus the five-year? How are you going to track which, when these fees come in for each of those loans, how you amortize those? Or can you just recognize those knowing that the bulk of the work really did occur up front? Do you recognize those up front? For some of you, these loans might not be very large and it might not be a material amount, but there are some lenders that this is going to be a substantial dollar amount. And so because of that, we do need guidance from the AICPA to determine what they expect you to do with these and how you are supposed to count for these. Are they all income in 2020? 
or are you going to have to defer some of that income based on the loans that maybe aren't 100% forgiven? If all the loans you make end up getting all 100% forgiven, I would have to assume they would allow you to re actually receive all of that income in 2020 and consider it at all, none of it having to be deferred. But that's something that just so you're aware, we are still looking for guidance to verify that our assumptions are correct on that. So hopefully there will be more information to come as we work through those. Um, some of the other ones that we have here is, um, so when, when does an idle advance reduce forgiveness amount? So I don't know, the idle, the EIDL loans, which are also SBA loans, those loans are ones that had an upfront 10, up to $10,000 advance that was considered um, a, a non-reimbursable advance, basically. So it was forgiven as well. And so if you applied for an idle loan and then also a PPP loan, depending on how that works, that idle loan may have to roll into your PPP loan forgiveness. And what they're basically saying is they don't want to have you get both of them forgiven. So if you do have both, that might also reduce your calculation, but from what we understand, that's actually going to be calculated and determined by the SBA when they look at your loan forgiveness based on um, some of the interim guidance that they came out with. So we're hoping for a little bit more clarity on that, on how that's actually gonna happen, but it does sound as though if you do have both of those, those cannot both get, um, both get forgiven. Um, I'm going to send this question to you, Megan, and it's um, due to the Flexibility Act extending to 24 weeks. If all funds are expended by week 10, can you start applying forgiveness at week 10, or do you have to wait for the full 24 weeks? Great question, and not the first time we've been asked that. Uh, we do not know the answer to that for sure. I'm hoping that will be out in the new application when that is released that it will address this issue because obviously the application was based off of two and a half months of payroll, you know, to kind of make sure that you were spending it mostly on payroll costs during this time. So obviously most people are gonna be able to expend those funds within 24 weeks and probably before if you were able to start using them the minute you got the loan funds. So I'm hoping that the answer to that is going to be yes, that you can start the application process as soon as you've expended all the funds, but we don't know the answer to that for sure. Thank you, Megan. Uh, the next question here that I will answer is, are bonuses paid during the covered period included in the forgiveness calculation? And the answer is, is yes, but with, with some exception and then also kind of a, a word of warning, maybe just kind of caution on that. You can use bonuses. I think a lot of people, when they realized that they weren't going to be able to utilize the full amount in the eight weeks because of the fact that they hadn't fully hired back yet, they started contemplating um, paying bonuses. And it's fine to pay those bonuses, but you have to make sure that the bonuses you're paying for that eight week period are actually based on the work done in that eight week period. So if you were thinking about paying bonuses based on employees work done in 2019 and they haven't been paid yet, and now you're saying, okay, let's make these bonuses paid now. Or if you are saying, well, we usually pay bonuses at year end, let's just pay them now, but it will basically be their bonus for the entire period. I would caution on those because of the fact that they really aren't bonuses that are for the covered period. You really want to make sure that if you're paying bonuses that it's only for that covered period. I think now that the week timeline got extended out to 24 weeks, most people are not going to need that. It was more of a way people I think were trying to figure out how to be able to actually use the money. And so uh, we just want to make sure that there's a word of caution there that when you're paying bonuses, you make sure that it really is truly based on the work in that covered period and paid, you know, by the next payroll for that covered period. 
The next one is, does the lender or the SBA determine final forgiveness? And to some extent, both. So if you take out a loan with your local bank or credit union, when you apply for the forgiveness, that forgiveness application goes originally to your credit union. That credit union then will review it and they have 60 days from the date of when they receive that forgiveness application to go through it and determine whether or not they give the initial forgiveness. But then once they actually do their part, they are then required to submit it to the SBA. The SBA then has an additional 90 days to be able to review that application as well. So it could be from the date that you um, sign, from the date from when you uh, file that forgiveness application, it might technically be another five months by the time you receive your official approval. And so it is a, a pretty large window of waiting for that, which I know is not something a lot of people are excited about, but um, it is just with the, the number of loans, they wanted to make sure they gave everybody enough time to be able to get through all these applications and be able to take enough time to really review them and do a good job of making sure that they are getting full forgiveness or if they're not, why they're not and things like that. And that's the other reason why it's really key to make sure that when you submit it the first time that you're submitting it correctly. If you submit it and the bank comes back or the credit union comes back and they say, you know what, you didn't answer this correctly. You know, you gave us documentation that says X and you put Y on the forgiveness application. They don't match. We're giving it back to you. You have to do it again. You're going to have to probably get back to the end of the line. So if there's a bunch of people that came after you that you know, put those applications in, your process is going to possibly have to start all over again. And that's something that you don't want to have to happen. You want to make sure that you submit it correctly the first time. Um, and this is something that I think Megan did a pretty good job touching on, but just to kind of to reiterate on based on the question is, will my loan forgiveness be reduced if I had laid off an employee and offered to rehire them and the employee declined my offer? And as she said, it, no, you just need to make sure that you do your best to document it. If you can get that employee to give it to you in writing, that's the most ideal, perfect way of doing it. Getting them to, to, to actually sign, a, you know, declining an offer, that's your best proof. However, we know that a lot of the times that's just not going to happen. And so you just need to document as best you can, you know, whether you have, you know, the person you talk to, the date they talk to them, you know, the time frame, you know, was it on phone call, was it in person, you know, how did the conversation happen, things like that. And then, like Megan said, you just want to make sure that you're um, getting that information into the into the unemployment office as well once they do decline your offer. Um, another question, and this is one that I'm going to um, send over to Megan as well, is if you use the alternative method for payroll. Do the other expenses follow that period or 56 days from the loan disbursement? So the alternative method is for payroll only. So all those non-payroll costs need to follow the date of the loan disbursement. Thank you. Another question that came in is, has there been any direction given or do you have any thoughts on how any funds that are not forgiven can be used? And there hasn't been any specific guidance that came out from the SBA that has indicated that once you go through this whole process, if you say have a $100,000 loan and $75,000 of it gets forgiven, and you have that $25,000 left that really does roll into a loan that goes over the two to or five period, to period or years, excuse me, there's nothing that says you have to use it for anything specific at this point. And so it's interpreted that it can be used for needed as the business once it's rolled into the loan. It would be something that I think that once that happens and you have that additional amount, that it would be a good idea to make sure that you, you talk to your lender or the SBA and determine, you know, do they have specific restrictions? That they're going to expect and then also to look at the documents that you signed um, for that loan 
and whether or not there's any restrictions noted in there. Um, and then I think Megan touched on this pretty well also, but do lease, a do lease payments for equipment qualify? And the answer is yes. So if you have, so just to give a quick example, if you have a truck, you decided to lease this truck starting on January 1st of 2020, and the lease goes for two years. Because of the fact that the lease was in place by February 15th, that's the first thing that you have to look at and determine whether or not it qualifies. So now that you know that it at least has already been in place by February 15th, then what you need to do is look and determine what that those lease payments would be during your covered period. And that's the amount that would qualify for forgiveness is the amount of those lease payments um, that are in that accrual period um, based on your covered period, whether it's eight or 24 weeks. And so the, the key dates really is one, the February 15th. So if you decide on February you know, 19th to lease a truck, then that does not qualify and you cannot use that one because it wasn't in place prior to that February, on that February, February 15th date. Um, let's see. Is another question is, is the unforgiven balance of the loan still guaranteed by the SBA? And the answer to that is, yes, it should be. Um, based on how the guidance came out originally, anything that was unforgiven would still be considered a guaranteed SBA loan. So just because it does not get forgiven doesn't mean then now all of a sudden those go back to the credit union to where the credit unions um, are responsible for that without that guarantee. Now, along with that, one of the things that you have to be aware of is if the SBA came, comes back to the credit union and states that for some reason there was something fraudulent that the, the bank or credit union did in the application to the SBA when they submitted it, they did something knowing it was incorrect or that there was something fraudulent going on, then there could be those issues when it comes to any type of SBA guaranteed loan where they could come back and say, you know, and come back to the credit union and say, you know, no, no, you you knew that this was incorrect. You you fraudulently or incorrectly gave us this information. So, but as long as everything was done correctly and the loan was submitted with the correct information and was approved, then those are still considered guaranteed by the SBA. Um, the other questions are still coming in, but the last one I have at this point is, what if a sole proprietor has not yet filed their 2019 tax returns? And the answer is, please file it as soon as possible. You cannot apply for forgiveness until you have filed your 29 tax return because the forgiveness calculation is based on your 29 tax return and you have to have that filed. So just note that even though a lot of the deadlines have been extended by the IRS, you still have to have that tax return completed to be able to fi file for forgiveness if you're a sole proprietor. So keep that in mind. And if that's a situation you're in, it's something where I would reach, if you're filing yourself, do it as soon as possible. If your CPA is filing it for you, please reach out to them as soon as possible to make sure you're getting that filed. Did any questions come in, Megan, that I might have missed while I was talking? I think I got them all. The only thing I just wanted to know, though, too, is we will be sending the slides out when we send out the recording. It'll take um, Asia a, a little bit of time to be able to compile that all together. But anybody who attended today, we will send out the slides and the video recording together so that you have both of them. I did not see any other questions come in. Megan, did you have any other items that you wanted to, any points I made or anything that you wanted to clarify? I just wanna to touch on something that I watched a AICPA webinar yesterday on this to try and get some perspective from them if they had anything, you know, in some of these gray areas that we've looked at. And 
some of the questions that have come in relate to the amount of compensation for those highly paid individuals uh, now that we have the 24 weeks. And before you had to, you know, prorate their amounts um, on, you know, eight over 52 weeks. And now if we've got the 24, does it increase that 15,385 max up to the 46,000? And we don't know. We're hoping that they come out with additional guidance. The AICPA indicated the same thing, that more guidance is needed before we can answer that fully. Um, the way the CARES Act originally read and then the Flexibility Act, when it struck the language and replaced it, didn't, didn't specifically state anything. And it still reads, you know, compensation of maximum of $100,000 as prorated for the covered period. But we want to use a word of caution. If you start applying for forgiveness before that's issued or before, you know, if it hopefully comes out, just to be careful um, doing that because you don't want to include that and then have them come back. And, you know, the difference between 46,000 and 15 is, is significant. So um, hopefully they'll come out with additional guidance on that sooner than later. Uh, we are checking the website multiple times a day. It's the first thing I do when I get to work to see if they've issued that updated application um, that they that they haven't yet. So that was the only other thing I think I wanted to clarify. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of unknowns still. We keep receiving some additional information, kind of bits and pieces at a time. And we're still patiently waiting for the SBA to, like Megan said, send out the new application for forgiveness. But I also am hoping that they're going to clarify a lot of other details that I still just don't think that we have enough information to really, to really give a full answer on. There's a lot of speculation out there, you know, like with Megan attending the AICPA, they're somewhat speculating on certain things as well. So I think that there is a possibility that, you know, some of this guessing game is right, but it some might be wrong and they might come out and come out with their Q&A or some more interim guidance that just completely is different than, when, than what everybody is expecting. The, what we signed into law last week was not detailed. It was very short, which, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but because of that, it still left a lot up for interpretation. Um, I, there was one other thing that I did want to mention that um, I think is something that people need to be aware of is when it comes to um, whether or not these are deductible as well. So once you get forgiveness, these expenses that you use for forgiveness, as of now, the IRS is saying those are not deductible. So you cannot if you are a for-profit entity, you cannot deduct those expenses. However, there are a total of four bills going through Congress right now that are trying to change that. So you can still use these as deductible expenses. They felt by saying that you not being able to deduct these is, is hurting the purpose of this program and making it harder on people that they're then going to have to pay more tax at the end of the year because they are no longer allowed to deduct these expenses. So it may change. As of now, the IRS is saying, no, they are not deductible, but just know that there are some bills going through Congress that may make that change in the near future. And so that is something that we are keeping an eye on here um, at Anderson Zermulin as well. So um, just be aware that there's a lot of things that are up in the air still, and we're doing our best to try to send the information out as it becomes clear and as we have a lot more clarity on those items. So I do want to thank um, Donya and Tracy again for helping us put this webinar on and making it happen. And I want to thank all the attendees for attending this. I know that this is um, very difficult to walk through right now, trying to figure out you know, all the different paths that you have to go down and how you need to make these calculations. So we're hoping that this did give you a little bit of clarity on what you need to do going forward. If for any reason you have any questions after this, please feel free to reach out either to myself or Megan. We're here to help, we're happy to help. We do have a full PPP team here in the firm. We're working diligently to be able to help with just questions, preparing the 
forgiveness applications, reviewing the forgiveness applications. So if there's anything you need from us, please make sure you reach out and we are happy to help. So with that, I will um, tell you all happy Friday and I hope you enjoy the weekend. Thank you very much for attending.